Today, though, we're, we're uh, continuing our series, Fear Not, um, heading towards Christmas. Christmas is one week away, and uh, I, love the, I love this passage of Scripture. In fact, I love how the kids acted it out um, with the shepherds and the sheep. The sheep are always my favorite part of the entire, because they are just, they are wanderers, like in real life, and we always pick sheep that are wanderers here, and it's fantastic. Um, but the, the, when God came and, and spoke through the angels to the shepherds, it was no small, insignificant point, point of this story. And so we're going to spend the rest of this morning talking about um, just that. Um, we are in uh, Luke chapter 2, and we're going to spend all of our time here in Luke chapter 2 uh, today, so you can open it up. A very well-known passage of Scripture. So what I want us to do, because this passage, you've probably read it um, Maybe already even this Christmas season, you've probably read it uh, in years past. It's one of the more popular passages. And so what we can tend to do with passages like this is we can say, well, I've heard that before, right? And we can just kind of check out. And what I want us to do is lean in, not check out, because I feel like God's got something for us here through the account of the shepherds again. Luke chapter 2, starting at verse 8, says this, And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And I might say you would be too, right? And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. What I find so fascinating about the Christmas story is who God showed up to first, right? Sure, we have Zechariah that we talked about three weeks ago. We have Mary and Joseph, which we talked about the last couple weeks. But then when the baby is born, who does God show up to first? Now, it was not uh, uncommon back in those days, especially with families who are, of well, uh, who are well off, to hire a herald when a baby was born. And a herald would be somebody that just goes and proclaims the news, especially if it was a boy. Um, they would go through and they would hire somebody to run through the town and herald out the news that this baby boy had been born. That was common practice back then. Now, we just have Facebook for that today, okay? So in social media, that's our herald. But uh, back in the day, could you imagine that? You were just eating dinner, and all of a sudden, somebody's running up, banging on your head. Hey, the Jones just had a baby boy. And then they run to the next house. Hey, did you know the jo they just had a boy? That would be wild, right? But that was common practice back then, and God does the same thing. He sends the angels to herald the good news or announce the good news of the birth of his son. But think about this, the son of God being born on earth. Who, who would we assume or presume that they would show up to first, right? That they would go and that they would uh, announce or herald out the good news of the Son of God being born, the Messiah who was prophesied for thousands of years. Surely he went to the temple first and announced it to the, all the priests and all of the, the uh, or the, as they put in the, the pastors or the religious leaders of the day. Surely there. Or maybe even they would go to the kings first and let the kings know, hey, listen, royalty, new royalty, born in Bethlehem. That's not what we see here. We see God coming the, through the angels to these shepherds. They heralded the announcement to these shepherds. And, you, and, and sitting here today, we think, well, of course, right? Because shepherds are in the nativity scenes. So of course they went to the shepherds first. Friends, this was happening back in the day before the nativity scenes. They were making the nativity scenes in real time, right? Shepherds end up in our nativity scenes because that's who God chose to first send. But what we need to understand is shepherds were the most, one of the most disrespected groups of people in that time. They were so low that, um, that it was reserved for mostly slaves. If families didn't have slaves, then it would be like the youngest son's problem. Like the youngest son would be sent out as a shepherd to take care of the, the sheep. They were looked down upon. 
According to just religious systems, shepherds were always rejected. Religious leaders taught that shepherds were, were, were just not good enough. Not good enough for society and not good enough for God himself. And so they were relegated to the fields. And so because of that, shepherds would have felt very distant, disconnected. I think this is an important message because I think there's a little bit of shepherd in all of us. That at points in our lives, we can feel disconnected from people and from God. Distant from people and God. Let's look at the shepherds, and I just hope that throughout this message, as we talk about these shepherds, that maybe you bump into yourself somewhere in there, and you can see how God used these shepherds and how he can use your life as well. So why did the, the, why did the shepherds feel distant from people and God? First of all, you can write this in if you have your bulletin notes. They felt very unworthy. They felt unworthy. They were outcasts of Israel. Like I said, you, in fact, um, they, they were specifically taught, you are not good enough for society. You are not good enough for God himself. So go out in the fields and do your thing. They were nomads. They were wanderers. Their jobs took them on the road. They would be gone for, for weeks on end in the fields without any stopping. They, I mean, they couldn't stop, right? They, they, if they stopped, their sheep died, right? If they took a day off, the sheep wandered off and died, Right? So they couldn't stop their job. So they would go for months, uh, weeks, even on the road. Um, and so they couldn't come back to the temple. Therefore, they were declared ceremonially unclean in the religious system of that day in Judaism. They were not, in other words, they, they, they were not right with God because they couldn't perform the religious duties that, that, um, because their, their job just kept them out on the road. They hung out with sheep. I think it was one of the cutest lines or parts of that play, right, when they said um, they probably even stunk, and all the, little, the girls were like, yeah, right? And they probably did. They hung out with sheep all day, right? They weren't, they weren't going to, a, uh, they weren't getting showers. Day. Like, they just stunk. They were, they were gross, dirty physically, but even more than that, they probably felt dirty spiritually. Religious people would have considered them spiritually dirty. So much so that even they, the, in the religious system of the day, if somebody touched a shepherd, then they too would become unclean, ceremonially unclean. They couldn't go in the temple for a period of days, right? Even if they just touched a shepherd. So they felt so unworthy and left out. And the reality is that many of us can feel that way too. I know we come in here, and by the time we hit the front doors, usually we got our church face on, and, and everything's okay, right? How are you doing today? We're doing good, right? But deep down, if we dig beneath the surface, many of us can come in here, and we can feel like, man, if, if these people just knew who I really was. I mean, I know the good things I should be doing, but I just don't. How could God love somebody like me? I feel so unworthy. And then we look around, especially during Christmas time, right? And everybody's smiling. Everybody's having a good time and coming into church. And everybody looks like they have their stuff together, right? Everybody, they all look, all, everything looks all Christmassy and holy and religious. And you're like, well, they all look good. And you're thinking to yourself, man, they're probably not like me. If they're anything like me, like, I just about killed my kid on the way here to church this morning, let alone that. I mean, you know how it goes when you're driving somewhere and your kids are acting up and you're just in the back like, get, knock it off, right? And if you connected, man, you know, you got that, that arm swap, right? And there's a line down the middle. Don't cross the line. Don't talk to each other. Don't look at each other. Everybody just get ready. We're going to worship Jesus, all right? Everybody get it together. We're good. Ready? Everybody, you have that pep talk in the car before you come into church? Like, everybody, okay, put it together, put it together. Well, I know what, hey, listen, I know I just yelled at everybody and everything, but we're just going to go to church. Everybody put a smile on. Let's go. I know we're not the only family, right? I will contend, I will always contend this, that whoever wrote, easy like Sunday morning, never went to church or had kids. 
because Sunday morning ain't easy when you got kids and you're trying to get them to church on time, right? But really, right, we, there's so many areas of our lives where when we look around and we can feel unworthy, just like these shepherds did. Like, man, I, I don't know if I fit in here. I don't even know if I fit in with God because of what I've done or who I am. Shepherds felt unworthy. They also felt inadequate. They felt uh, they were uneducated, um, so they never felt like they measured up in society. Um, it's amazing how inadequate we can feel at times, can't it? Right? Uh, ladies, you go to your friends' homes, and their house is perfect. It smells like candles. Their floor is actually clean, right? Their kids' hair is brushed. You walk into your house, and it looks like a bomb went off, and sure, it certainly doesn't smell like candles. It smells a whole lot like something else, and your hair hasn't seen a brush since 1987. And, like, it just, sometimes you can look around at other people, and, and and then you look at yourself or your family or you look at other people's kids or you look at your, and you can just feel inadequate. Guys, I, I know we don't like to talk about our feelings or admit it very much, but, but there's moments where we feel inadequate too, where we look around at other guys and what they have, the toys they may have or the wife or kids they have, the money they make or the, the job they have, the body type or the... The hairline that they have, I mean, I know that's coming, right? And we're like, man. And guys, whether we admit it or not, there's times and there's moments and seasons where we can just feel inadequate, much like the shepherds would have. And they know how you feel. Everyone around them, they, 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 they never encountered a situation in society where they felt like they, were, they had the upper hand. They always felt less than. And then even worse, spiritually, like if they compared themselves spiritually, um, they were inadequate. The, one of the big rules of the religious time of that day was to keep the Sabbath, right? And, and so they were supposed to work for six days, and then they would keep the Sabbath. And, and if you've been doing our, your reading plan through the Gospels uh, with their discipleship groups, you've realized, right, that, that Sabbath keeping was a big deal within that religious system. And, and they just couldn't do it. Their job, again, they, they, their job didn't allow them to take Sabbath. And so in, in, in every way, they felt inadequate physically and spiritually. And sometimes we can feel that way too. We can look around at other people and we're like, man, they, they just seem so close to God. Boy, they, man, I, I wish I could pray like that or, or, or know that or, or, or be like that spiritually. I wish I could be that close to God. I just feel, I mean, their prayers seem so spiritual. And my la the last time I prayed was like, God, please don't let me kill these people in the mall parking lot because they took my spot, right? That was the last prayer we prayed. And, and they, they're praying all these holy spiritual things. The shepherds felt unworthy, inadequate, and they also felt very unloved. The reality is that people didn't trust um, shepherds. In fact, um, the, the predominant thought was that all shepherds are thieves. That's just what they believed, that all shepherds were thieves, that they would go in and steal. And so everybody was distrusting of shepherds. Um, they were so distrusted, in fact, that they were not allowed to give testimony in a court case because no one believed they could tell a truth. And because of that, they wanted, it, I mean, I'm sure these guys wanted to get married, right? But who would, whose father would allow their daughters to marry a shepherd? And so because of that, they were lonely. They were a lonely group of people, unloved. They had hopes of a better future, but there was really nothing to get them there. And the reality is, for a lot of us, we can feel unloved too, Right? whether that's from our childhood growing up. Some of you know the pain and the hurt that associates when your parents have divorced and your dad left and it was just you and your mom. And you're like, well, what did I do wrong? What, what, what did I do? Some of you are in a 
maybe in a, a rough spot right now in your marriage and you're just not in the same in sync with your spouse and you feel inadequate and unloved and you're just wondering, what did I do? What, wh- how do we fix this brokenness? How, how, do I, how do I feel loved again? And then the reality is some of us look in the mirror and we don't even love the person staring back at us in the mirror. We're just like, ah, how should anybody, how, would God, how should God love me or how should anybody else love me because the person I look at in the mirror, I don't even love. And the perception on days like today in church is we will come in and we think, man, everybody's got it all together. You know, I'm sure everybody else, they've all, they've all got everything, a handle on everything, and everything's great, and there's no stress in their life. They're all, everything's perfectly wrapped and under the tree, and everything's ready for them, and their kids, you know, everything's perfect for their Christmas, and look at me, I'm a complete mess. And because of that, I feel unworthy and inadequate and unloved. And and even spiritually speaking, like this is the first time I've been in church in a year since last Christmas. And everybody else seems so holy and spiritual in here. I, I am less than. And the great reality and the great news is, number one, you're not alone. Because as you look around and think, man, everybody else got it together in here, I can, I can guarantee you they don't. And the great other, sec- the, the second piece of great news is this <laughs> that God came to announce the birth of the Savior of the world to people just like you. Just like you. Who, people who felt unworthy and inadequate and unloved, God came to say, hey, guess what? Jesus is here. The Messiah is here. There's good news here. And he came not to the people who thought they had it all together and acted like they had it all together or the royalty of the day. He came to you and I and said, hey, hey, guess what? You may feel this way today, but there's good news. There's good news. And this is the message of the shepherds to the shepherds, right? Fear not. Notice what he says in verse 10. Um, And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy, which will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. I love this. He says, I bring you good news. That word, good news, euangelion, is in the Greek word good news, and it's this word, gospel. I bring you the gospel. I bring you the good news of a great joy. What is this good news of a great joy? Why is it good news? First of all, you can write this in. It's great news of a good uh, it's good news of a great joy because it's for all people. It's for all people. It's for those who who um, who feel like the shepherds felt. It's for all of us. This message is for the poor and the rich and everywhere in between. It's for every race and nationality and people groups of the world. It's a, it's a message for the brokenhearted. It's a message, it's a good news of a great joy for the people who are struggling with anxiety and fear and depression. It's the good news of a great joy that's for people who are struggling in marriage or struggling in parenting or struggling physically. It's good news of a great joy for all people. Not just for people who look like they have their lives together but also for people whose lives are perpetually a hot mess. It's for you. Jesus is for you. The Bible continually shares this truth in other places that this is good news for everyone. In Romans chapter 1, it says this, for I, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. That same word, you and Gellion, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Romans 5, 18, therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for who? all men. 
There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to who? All people. It's the message that's continuously shared through, from Jesus' birth all throughout Scripture is that God has come for all. And all is pretty encompassing, right? It's the good news of a great joy for all people. It's good news of a great joy because it's all about a Savior. It's all about a Savior. This message centers around this idea of a Savior. And the presence of savior, a Savior usually indicates that there, we need to be saved from something. And that's certainly the case, right? That although this is great news of, uh, uh, good news of a great joy, it's that the Savior's coming because you and I are in desperate need of a Savior because you and I can't save ourselves. You know how I know that? Because if you could have, you would have. If you would have been able to get your life all together by yourself, you would have already. But the reality is we can't. Apart from Jesus, apart from a Savior, we don't have a we don't have a chance because we are all sin-filled people who fall short of God's standards. The Bible goes over this over and over. Romans 3 says this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. But God showed his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation. That word just means atoning sacrifice for our sins. And we have seen and testify that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. This is the storyline of the Bible, the, the, the good news, this, this, what the angels announce to people like you and like me are this, that it's good news of a great joy because it's for all people, and it's about a Savior, and he is Christ the Lord, and you can write that in. This message centers on Jesus. It's a great news because you and I aren't stuck in our sin. You and I aren't stuck in the mess of life, but rather there's a plan from God to get us out of the mess we find ourselves in. And it was this baby born in a barn in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. Jesus was the plan of salvation. And Jesus is the plan of our salvation. The Bible continues to say this over and over. It says this in the book of Acts, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other, na other name under heaven given uh, among men by, what, by which we must be saved. And in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespass according to the riches of his grace, and now, in which now we have been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. That is the good news of a great joy. That is why we sit in the church today. Because if it wasn't for that, friends, there's really no point in us being here. Right? If, if, if this isn't true, then we've just wasted a bunch of time this morning. We might as well get on with our day. But the truth is that we have a Savior who is born to us. He is Christ the Lord. It's the good news of a great joy. So let's look at how the shepherds responded. Look in your Bible to verse 12. And this will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, 
and on earth peace among those whom with he is pleased. And when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's, uh, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby laying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that, he, uh, that had been told to them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told him. But Mary treasured these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. So the shepherds, they, they responded. The first thing that they did and the first thing that I would suggest we do when we're uh, confronted with the same message that the shepherds uh, were given is they did this. They drew near to Jesus. They drew close to Jesus. I love this part, right? That they, what did it say they do? So the angels come and they say, don't fear. And then all these other angels show up and the, the sky is filled with angels. And they all say, glory to God in the highest on earth, peace among those whom uh, he is pleased. And the angels went away into heaven. And what was the response of the shepherds? It says this, let us go. Let us go, right? They, they, they went immediately because they had to see this Jesus. They had to see this thing. Sometimes this is so, like, sometimes this is the frustrating part about living out our faith, right? Because I feel like for many of us and, and for many people, um, when, we are, when God says to us, let, hey, go check this thing out, our response isn't let us go. When God says, I, I, I want you to go over here and do this thing, right? I, I want you to go and I want you to get involved in this. Our response isn't always let us go. It's, well, I got a few more questions for you, God. How is this going to work into my schedule? Right? I don't really have time for that, Lord. I, I, the shepherds could have made these excuses, right? Well, who's going to watch the sheep? It, it seems like they just ditched the sheep, right? They couldn't help. God said, hey, there's this thing happening, and they're just like, let's go. It was immediate obedience. We've been talking about this over and over in this series, right? What's, what's our responsibility? Obedience. What's God's outcome? And this is another instance where the shepherds, as soon as they were given the instruction, they just go because they had to draw near to Jesus. They had to come close. They had to be there physically. They had to see it for themselves. And they moved their feet. Friends, sometimes faith, often, often I should say, faith means moving our feet. It means drawing close. It means moving into proximity to where God is at work. That's one of the prayers that we pray, that I pray is that, God, let me let me just see where you're at work and can I join you there? And too many of us make plans and ask God to just bless our plans, right? Could you just rubber stamp what I already wanted going on, God, and you could just join me in my work? And God says, I got a work going on and I want you to join me there. And so they, these shepherds, we can learn something from these shepherds if we've admitted along this whole time, right, that, that there's a little bit of shepherd in all of us. Because we felt in unloved and inadequate and, and, and unworthy, right? And that we recognize that the good news of a great joy is for people like us. And that Jesus is the Savior of the world, that he did come and die for people like you and I. He came into this world for you and I. Then our response should be like the shepherds as well and draw close to Jesus and where he's at work. The second response they had is they shared what God had done for them. So they came and they saw and they, they says they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph. And then it says, and when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning the child. Of course they did, right? Of course they did. 
right? All that, all that feeling of inadequacy, all that feeling of being unloved, uh, of, of, uh, of feeling like a social outcast, that went out the window for them. They busted out of that barn and couldn't wait to tell anybody and everybody what they just saw, right? They busted out and they said, listen, you got to go look at that. You see that? You see the star? You see? Go over there and look. The Savior of the world is here. They couldn't help themselves. They had to make known what they saw because they encountered Jesus in their life. Friends, if you've encountered Jesus in your life, you have to make known what you've seen. But pastor, I don't know, I can't, I can't, I don't know all the scriptures. I don't, listen, the shepherds weren't theologians. They didn't have all the answers. They didn't know all the Old Testament prophecies that led up to this moment. They didn't care. All they knew is that they saw the Savior born, and they saw what it did to their life, and they couldn't wait to tell everybody. And that's what you can do. If you've experienced Jesus in your life, just tell people what you've experienced, what you've seen. You don't have to know all the answers. All you need to know is your story and start there. They shared what God had done for them. And then they glorified and worshiped God. And the shepherds returned to their fields, hoping that the angels had stuck around a little bit to wrangle sheep, I'm sure. But they went back to the fields glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen. Is that our response? When we encounter Jesus, when we see God at work, is to glorify and praise him. It's our natural heart's inclination to glorify and praise God when we see or hear him at work in our lives. Because that's what the shepherds did. They couldn't help it. I'm sure that this forever changed their life. One encounter with Jesus when he was just a baby in a manger. Remember, this is before Jesus lived a perfect life died on the cross for the sins of humanity and rose three days later beating death so that all who believe and trust in him have a hope of eternal life. This is 33 years before all that. And yet for these shepherds, one encounter with Jesus forever changed their lives. Friends, fast forward to our stories. We have the access to the whole of the gospel, the complete gospel, where we live on the other side of the cross. How much more should our response to all that God is, all that God does, and all that he will do, worship? That our lives would be an outpouring of worship and glorifying God. We talk about this here often, right? Because this is the reason we believe we exist as a church, to lift Jesus higher than anything else in this world, right? And that's not, uh, uh, that was never meant to be some fancy little saying that we put on a bulletin not live out in our lives. It starts with you and I living out glorifying God in our lives, that he, that we exist to lift him higher, to give him glory, honor, and praise. And then collectively as a church that we do the same. And why do we do that? Why do we draw close to Jesus? Why do we share what God has done for us? And why do we glorify and worship God? Because there's a little bit of shepherd in all of us. And when we recognize, like the shepherds did, who they once were, all that God had done for them, they couldn't help the response part. 
And you and I, as we recognize how often we feel and all that God has done for us, our response should be the same. So let me ask you a question as we close down today. How do you need to respond today? How do you need to respond? We saw how the shepherds responded, right? What do you need to do? For some of you, you're in this space where you just feel unloved, unworthy, inadequate. Maybe you need to come to a spot where you believe the good news of a great joy, that Jesus is for you, that he's for you, that he is a savior, not just of the world, but for you, that for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's not just a verse for everybody else. That's not just a verse for the world, but that's a, mess, that's a verse for you. For God so loved, insert your name, that he gave his one and only son. And the greatest gift, Christmas gift of all humanity is that he gave himself. So maybe for you, the response today needs to means for the first time stepping into God's love and realizing you need a savior and that is, he is Christ the Lord. And respond to him in faith. Give your life to him. And draw close to Jesus, maybe for the first time. Have your sins washed clean so that you can live a new life in him. I guarantee you it would be the greatest Christmas gift you ever received. Maybe for some of you, you've done that. But just because of life, you've drifted apart from Jesus and you needed to come back and draw near to him. Maybe you feel like you're in a great spot with Jesus and you feel like, man, I I do feel like I'm in in a good spot. Then maybe your response needs to be like the shepherds and you're just going to go tell. Go go share. Come and see and then go and tell. Right? You've, You've done the come and see part. Now you need to do the go and tell part. And share what God's done for you. For some of you, maybe it's coming back to just a place of worship. Not just here on Sunday mornings, not just when the band strikes a chord, not just when when, um, we're all singing together, but that your life would be defined by bringing God glory in every space and sphere of your life, that you bring God glory in worship as you live out your life. How do you need to respond today? Let's respond like the shepherds. And wherever you find yourself in that, respond like the shepherds. We have a prayer team up here when I close in prayer. And if you need prayer for something in your life, come and be prayed for. If you need to respond um, to this good news of a great joy, which is for you, You'd like to talk about what it looks like to give your life to Jesus. Come, please either talk to the prayer team, talk to myself, to somebody by you. Let's contemplate this over this. Yeah, it was, it was amazing watching these kids perform the Christmas. They did such a great job. It was so awesome. But what I want you to do is I want you to consider as we leave here, what God has given to you, what God's spoken to you through our time in the Word together.